Why have the wicked come up? Because they've all been bought by the blood of Christ. Because they don't have to die if they would believe. As in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Everyone's been redeemed from the grave, wicked and righteous. So if men will believe, they needn't come up in the second, they'll come up in the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Let's look at another story that I think is important. In the 20th chapter, it tells us in verse 3 that Peter came out with the other disciples and went toward the tomb. They both ran, the other disciples outran Peter and reached the tomb. Stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there. Now, friends, I want to remind you of something. When the high priest finished the work of atonement on the day of atonement, Leviticus 16 says he left his clothes in the sanctuary. Then he went out to bless the people. And so when Christ finished his work of atonement on the cross, he left his clothes in the tomb. And when the disciples look in and see it, that should have said to them, our high priest has finished the atonement. The world is reconciled. It is finished. It is done. That should have been their cry. Now come please the 21st chapter. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. And it talks about the men going fishing. It says in verse 4, as day was breaking, after their night without catching anything, Jesus stood on the beach. And yet the disciples didn't know it was Jesus. He says to them, children, have you any fish? No. Cast the net on the right side and you'll find some. They cast it. Now they're not able to haul it in. The quantity of fish is so great. Now here's a great story at the end of the gospel and it's like another story at the beginning of the gospel. In Luke 5, remember, Jesus sat in a boat after they'd been fishing all night. He said, all right, let down your nets for a draft and they pulled up all these fish and remember in that story uh, it spoke about the nets breaking. A lot of the fish escaped. But finally they come to land. Now this story is different. They've been fishing all night, caught nothing, that's the same as before. But now the master's not on the ship, he's on the land. This is a symbol of the ship of the church out in the stormy waters of the world while the master's on the other shore. And he tells us how to fish from heaven. And if we fish without him, we'll get nothing. We follow his instructions, we'll get plenty. And this time the net doesn't break because this represents the end. And those who've endured to the end, the same shall be saved. This time they come faithfully ashore. So you must compare this with the call of the disciples, Luke 5, when he was in the ship, representing the beginning of the Christian age, when Christ was with his disciples. But now he's not in the ship, he's on the other shore, representing the whole Christian era when the church, the ship, is guided by Christ from the other shore, from heaven. And if we follow his directions, we'll bring the fish in and we'll get them to shore. It's also a figure of... Uh, life and death. After night came the dawn. After being on the heaving sea, they went through the foaming surf to the shore of safety. That's life. You and I are now living on the heaving sea. If it's quiet for you now, be of good cheer, it won't be for long. Sea is ever heaving. Storms are the rule on life's sea. But friends, they're not forever. There'll come a time when we'll hear the noise of the foaming surf. The doctor may whisper to you, I'm sorry, I can't give you more than another so many days, months. And you hear the foaming surf of death. But, my friends, once you're through the foaming surf, when Jesus comes, you're on the other shore. Everything's safe. So it's a picture of going from life in this world through the foaming waters of death and then the coming of Jesus. You're on the other shore. Look at one other thing here. It says in verse 9, when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. And Jesus said, bring some of the fish that you've caught. And Simon Peter went abroad and hauled the net full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus had come to have breakfast. He didn't say, come and listen to a sermon. He fed them. He knew they'd been working all night. Jesus is very practical. I love the text that says that God gives us all things necessary for life and godliness. I'm glad it didn't just say godliness. I want to be more godly than I am, but I'm very interested in life. And the text says God gives us all things necessary for life and godliness. 
So we have a Heavenly Father who cares for the body. Come and have breakfast, says Jesus. He doesn't say, sit here and I'll give you another sermon on the mount. While well, their stomach is churning. Come and have breakfast, he says. They come and have breakfast. When they finish, verse 15, he says to Simon Peter, Simon, do you love me more than these? He remembers that Simon three times said, Lord, though all men forsake you. These 11 are not much good, Lord, but I'm better. I love you more than them. I'll never forsake you. These 11, mate, not me, Lord. So the Lord now asks him three times. Peter's denied him three times. Christ asks him three times. Do you love me more than these, Simon? Simon's not boastful now. He just says, Lord, you know the truth on this matter. He will not boast now. Jesus says, feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. Three times he does it. What's he trying to say? Well, of course, he's replacing Peter. He's re-establishing Peter. Peter's denied him three times. Now he affirms him three times. And he says to Peter, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. He's going to be the chief shepherd in the church. His name always heads the list. We don't have to be afraid of that with our Catholic brothers and sisters. Peter was not celibate and he was never at Rome as a pastor, so far as we know. But he is the chief shepherd of the church. That's why he always heads the list of the twelve apostles. He opens the church at Pentecost and at Caesarea to Jews and to Gentiles. But the important thing is not that. The important thing is the only condition for service, Christian service, is do you love me? He didn't say, Peter, you've got three PhDs. The only BA you need is to be born again. That's all you need. You got that BA? You're born again? Peter, do you love me? That's the only condition for Christian service. Do you love me? And my friend, it's a love that will be able to survive the, the threat of death. If you look further down, Peter didn't lose his old nature overnight, so he said, what about this man John? The Lord said, leave that to me. If I will that he tarry till I come, what's that to thee? Follow thou me. Even when you think you're in a high class now, you know you love Jesus. The test is whether you really love your neighbours. Because if you don't really love your neighbours, you don't love Jesus. So here's Peter interested in John, but Christ is saying, look, don't try and plan for John. I will that he tarry till I come. What's that to thee? Follow thou me. We're to love our brethren, but not try to dictate to them. Our love to brethren shows whether we really love Christ. And then the Lord says to him, he says, when you were young, this is verse 18, you girded yourself, walk where you would. When you're old, you'll stretch out your hands. Another will gird you, carry where you would not. This he showed by what death he would glorify God. Here he foretells Peter's future. The time will come when Peter will be crucified, upside down. But it's a message for all of us. In youth, you go where you like. In youth, energy is abundant. But the time comes for all of us when energy is not so available, where there are limitations on where we go and what we can do, where we are girded by another sometimes, cared for by another. Our Lord Jesus is trying to say, Peter, whether you're young or whether you're old, whether you're living or whether you're dying, I'm sufficient for you, Peter. The sufficiency of Christ is the message of Calvary. We have God the Father over us. We have God the Son for us. We have God the Holy Spirit in us. The whole Godhead is on our side because of the cross. Because of the cross, it's right for God to forgive our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. That's possible because of the cross of Christ. Christ has departed, but he sent us another comforter who abides with us forever. He brings the presence of Jesus. He doesn't speak of himself. A true Pentecostal religion focuses on Calvary. Calvary leads to Pentecost, Pentecost comes back to Calvary and Calvary gives us a message, I'll not leave you alone, I will come to you, for I'll pray the Father, he'll send you another comforter, he may abide with you forever. So my friends, from Calvary we hear the words, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor principalities or powers, or things present, or things to come, or anything in all of creation can separate us from the love of Christ Jesus our Lord. For it's Christ that justifieth, who is he that condemneth? Christ is for us. God grant we may so believe it that we will be for Christ. God bless you.